It's my pleasure to now introduce another of my MIT colleagues, Lori Boyer. Uh, Lori is currently the Sizer Career Development Associate Professor of Biology. Um, she's also an extramural member of the Koch Institute. Uh, Lori got her PhD with Craig Peterson at uh, UMass in Worcester. She then did her postdoctoral studies here at MIT in the Whitehead Institute as a joint postdoc with Rudy Anish and Rick Young. Uh, and during her postdoctoral studies, uh, Lori really introduced uh, to those labs and really to the field uh, high throughput methods for genome-wide analysis of important regulators of stemness uh, in those cells and was able to work out uh, some of the core regulatory networks um, that allow embryonic stem cells to remain embryonic stem cells. Uh, and that work was actually highly recognized, including in, 19, in 2006, uh, Lori was recognized as uh, one of the top 50 leaders in research by Scientific American for her innovative work in that area. Uh, she was recruited to the MIT faculty in 2007, uh, and she's continued uh, to use these methods to understand not just stem, stemness, uh, but also how stem cells uh, then commit to various lineages. And that will be the topic of her talk today, uh, taking a coordinated approach to understand um, commitment to lineage decisions. Lori. Um, I want to thank the organizers tremendously for the opportunity to speak here today. As Tyler mentioned, um, I was a postdoc at the Whitehead, so I've actually been attending the symposia for uh, quite some time, from the time that I was sort of wet behind the ears and sitting on this side. So it feels really uh, like a tremendous opportunity to be on this side of the microphone. Um, so Tyler gave me some really great advice last night, considering how it was my first time speaking in such a symposium, and he said, don't screw up. So um, with that, <laughs> I think I'll get started and talk to you today about um, dynamic and coordinated regulation of developmental transitions in the cardiac lineage. And if you find this title somewhat cumbersome and boring, then just stick with how long non-coding RNAs can break your heart. OK. So my lab is very broadly interesting, interested in dissecting the gene regulatory logic. Um, that drives early cell fate decisions during mammalian development, and how failure to establish proper gene expression programs can lead to developmental defects and diseases such as cancer. So we've heard a lot today about how disruption of gene regulation in transcriptional networks can really underpin many types of cancers, but today I'm going to focus on the consequences on development. So in particular, we're very interested in understanding how um, these early unspecialized cells of the mammalian embryo that actually maintain substantial, remarkable developmental plasticity decide what to become later in development. How do these, this unspecialized population of cells give rise to the complexity of an adult organism that comprises over 200 functionally distinct cell types? Well, this is very difficult, obviously, to study in the context of an intact organism, and there are even rules uh, against this and doing this in human. So not surprisingly, um, embryonic stem cells, or ES cells, have become an important and widely used model to understand how cells make decisions during early development. So they're a great model of mammalian embryogenesis. Um, these cells, uh, for those of you who don't think about um, ES cells every day, can be derived from the early embryo, and they maintain many of the properties of the inner cell mass in that um, they can give rise to derivatives of all three germ layers, namely endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. So not surprisingly, these cells are a potential source for regenerative therapies, but also ES cell differentiation really provides a powerful method for dissecting the mechanisms of lineage commitment. Recent efforts in our lab have really focused around understanding the gene regulatory mechanisms that drive cardiac um, differentiation. So why do we study the heart? Well, for me personally, I think the heart is an extraordinarily cool organ. Without it, we would not be living. Um, it's the first functional organ to develop in all vertebrates. 
And it's a very complex process that requires the concurrent differentiation of several cardiovascular cell types that must organize into a complex functional structure. And um, not surprisingly, this requires um, precise temporal and spatial activation and repression at the global level of gene expression programs. And so thus, heart development is exquisitely sensitive to regulation of thousands of genes. One thing that I want to point out to you are these two um, cell types here at the beginning. So heart development obviously starts um, when the pluripotent cells begin to differentiate. And um, during gastrulation, um, which is marked by uh, this over here um, as a primitive streak, cells that are destined to become the mesoderm and ultimately the heart field ingress and move to the anterior portion of the primitive streak. And this is marked by brachyuria. And so these are basically precardiac mesoderm cells. The earliest um, factor that specifies the cardiac fate is this transcription factor called MESP1. It's a beta helix loop transcription factors. Um, and it really is important because this is like the ultimate progenitor for heart development. It gives rise to not only the cells of the first heart field, but also the second heart field, and also um, the epicardial progenitors. And so it's really important to understand the transition between mesoderm and this um, cardiac cell type. However, we know little about the molecular regulators of this mesoderm to cardiac transition. And why is this important? Well, we know that disruption of transcriptional networks underpins congenital heart disease, which is the leading cause of infant morbidity that occurs in about 1% of all live births. Um, not only that, but heart disease is the leading cause of death in industrialized nations. One thing that I want to point out is the adult heart is comprised of largely um, cardiomyocytes, over 50% cardiomyocytes. And heart disease can actually lead to substantial loss of cardiomyocytes, as well as um, this occurs during the normal process of aging. However, the heart is one of the least regenerative organs in the body. So in order to combat um, heart disease and also to understand heart development, we really need um, detailed knowledge of the molecular switches that drive cardiogenesis. And this will also help us to uh, design uh, new therapeutic targets for perhaps regenerative therapy. So we've heard a lot about the dynamic regulation of gene expression and how um, it's important for maintaining proper regulation to maintain cell fate. Um, obviously, proper regulation of gene expression from a pluripotent cell to a terminally differentiated cell where you have an increase in lineage commitment requires multiple inputs. So we've heard about transcription factors, chromatory modeling enzymes, DNA methylation, and by and large, we study many aspects of, of this in the lab. Um, many of the transcription factors, as well as chromatin regulators that are important for heart development have been elucidated to some extent, and there's a wealth of genetic information on the factors that are important for driving this process. So we wanted to try and discover something new. And we wanted to understand, perhaps, what is the role for non-coding RNAs. And in particular, we're interested in um, understanding the role of long non-coding RNAs. Um, so as a class, uh, these are non-protein coding transcripts that just arbitrarily have a cutoff of about 200 nucleotides to separate from the class of smaller RNAs. They look and smell just like an mRNA in that they're five prime caps sliced and polyadenylated. Um, the thing that I want to focus on, even though there have been a number of roles ascribed to long nine coding RNAs, they appear to be potent and specific regulators of gene expression. There have been a number of um, mechanisms that have been suggested for how these function, but we're nowhere near a, a really clear understanding of how these work. One thing that I do want to point out is there have been reports that suggest that these long nine coding RNAs can regulate gene expression in cis um, to a neighboring gene, but also in trans. And um, also, it's thought that these long nine coding RNAs can recruit protein complexes, although that is still um, not a widely recognized mechanism, considering how there are still thousands of long non-coding RNAs that we don't know their function. 
I think for us, what really brought us into this is that many of these long non-coding RNAs display cell type expression patterns suggesting that they could be regulators of lineage commitment. There was a very nice study that was published last year by Mitch Goodman that showed that there are quite a few long non-coding RNAs that are highly expressed in ES cells. And when you deplete these, they have um, uh, severe consequences either on maintenance of self-renewal or they lead to upregulation of global lineage programs. However, their precise roles in lineage commitment have really not been defined. Okay, with that said, we wanted to look for long non-coding RNAs that could potentially be regulators of heart development. So our strategy essentially was to identify, um, I, it was based on our hypothesis that we would expect that long non-coding RNAs that might play a role in early specification. So I mean really this process of going from a pluripotent cell to mesoderm to that first cardiac cell may be expressed high in pluripotent cells and then ultimately in the heart, whereas they would be expressed low in other differentiated cell types. So in essence, did our strategy work? Well, I'm saying now we've identified some, so I guess it did. Um, here, what we did is we performed an analysis where we examined RNA-seq transcript levels for a number of ES cells, as well as differentiated cell types that represent the three germ layers. And we looked for long non-coding RNAs that um, had an expression metric where they were high in ES cells and low in most other differentiated tissues. Um, here are just three examples. Anything that's beyond this line was significant, so we identified a number. But at this point, we didn't know if any of these would be important for heart development. So to look at this further, I'm showing you three examples of the kind of long non-coding RNAs that come out of this. Um, on the left here are ES cells. They're just a couple of different ES cell lines. And you can see here, um, this particular transcript is highly expressed in ES cells and not in the other differentiated cell types where this one is also highly expressed in ES cells and specifically in the testes. And I'm gonna focus on this particular long non-coding RNA that shows high expression in ES cells and also high expression in the heart. So we focus further attention on this candidate, AK143260. Um, this is located on chromosome 18 and we confirmed its um, transcript structure by five prime and three prime race. I will tell you that it has three exons um, this is the predominant form, although we do find a minor form that is 50 base pairs shorter um, in ES cells as well. But this is really the, the major form. Consistent with our race, we do find um, that uh, a transcript exists quite abundantly in ES cells by Northern. Um, and, uh, and it's the same size as, as this, although we couldn't distinguish this on this particular Northern. So then the question is, if we predict that this long non-coding RNA would have a role in gene regulation, then you may expect that this long non-coding RNA should be enriched in the nucleus. So we fractionated um, ESL um, and made extract nuclear and cytoplasmic extracts. This is just to show that we see an enrichment for H3 in the nucleus where we see gap DH in the cytoplasm. And as we expect, um, our long non-coding RNA is enriched in the nuclear fraction compared to gap DH. So with this in hand, we decided to analyze the function of this particular transcript. So as I mentioned, it has three exons. We designed um, hairpins against two of these exons. And you can see here by RNA levels that we have sufficient knockdown of this particular transcript. And this is all con also confirmed by Northern. So personally, my um, goal was to identify link RNAs that show expression in ES cells but if you deplete them, don't actually have an effect on ES cells, but rather would be important for when the cells are differentiated. So consistent with that, when you knock down this particular transcript using either hairpin, and for actually the remainder of the talk, we've done all the experiments actually with both hairpins, but I may just be presenting one or the other. You can see here that um, the depleted ES cells display normal ES cell properties by Brightfield in here for OC4 staining. Um, they also have normal cell cycle kinetics and expression of pluripotency markers. So the true test now becomes, is this actually, does this particular um, transcript actually have a consequence on differentiation? And even though um, we found that it was expressed highly in the heart, 
we wanted to take an unbiased approach to try to see if it had a role generally in differentiation or in a specific lineage. So one of the most common assays people use is uh, the formation of embroid bodies as a method for differentiation. And so essentially all you do is you take ES cells, you allow them to aggregate in the absence of the growth factor lift that actually maintains ES cells, and then these EBs over time can actually form derivatives of all three germ layers. So we analyzed these. Here I'm just showing you the wild type, but um, for the most part, the depleted EBs looked quite similar. But one of the things that we found really quite striking is that actually during this time, uh, time course, at about day nine or 10 of EB formation, these EBs actually can start beating. So it's actually a very nice visual assay for the presence of contracting um, cardiomyocytes. And I, I had a movie, but it's not working, unfortunately. But what we observed is that um, <clears throat> in the control, which is just a, a non-targeting hairpin, um, we saw you know, a nice proportion of our EBs show beating. However, in either um, uh, link RNA knockdown, we essentially saw little to no beating EBs. So this suggested to us that we certainly had a defect in cardiomyocyte differentiation. And consistent with this, um, if we looked at um, either by staining or by um, mRNA, cardiac troponin T, which is really a, a, key, um, a key part of uh, cardiac muscle contraction, um, in either of the, the knockdowns, you don't, it's not on, whereas in normal, it goes way up at about the time where you see beating EBs. Okay, but you can say then, okay, well, it could be two things. Either cardiomyocyte differentiation is being specifically affected or all differentiation is being specifically affected. So we actually section the EBs, and although this is not coming out clearly, and we find evidence of all three germ layers including, say, gut epithelium. We find cartilage, and I want to point out that this is another mesodermal-derived tissue, so it doesn't seem to be a just total defect in mesoderm induction. And also here we see neural rosettes. So to us, this really suggested that there is some specific effect on cardiomyocyte differentiation. Okay, so obviously we're predicting that this may have a role in regulating gene expression, um, we kind of took a chance here because EBs are quite a heterogeneous tissue, if you will. And so we reasoned that if a specific lineage was being affected, then we should be able to tease out those gene expression changes in our EBs over time. So what I'm showing you here is exactly that. So we performed RNA-seq um, during EB differentiation and collected several time points. The striking thing is, is that obviously you see genes go up and genes go down, but when you actually look at the function of these genes, we actually see no functional categories for the genes that go up, suggesting that these could just be kind of indirect effects. But I, I find that um, the most striking thing of this is all of the genes that go down have roles in organ morphogenesis and um, myofibril assembly, things to do with heart and cardiovascular development. So this suggested to us that, um, oh, and I forgot to tell you, we named our gene Braveheart. And I, I actually wanted to ask people, since this is a, a movie and Mel Gibson seems to be really cranky lately, maybe this is not the best name for it. Um, and I'm not sure you can name a gene after a book and a movie, so if you know that, let me know. Um, in any case, so we call this Braveheart due to its phenotype. And we see that depletion leads to significant changes in gene expression, and not only to um, global changes in gene expression, but predominantly of genes that are important for um, cardiogenesis. So we're pretty excited by this, and so we wanted to actually see how these genes were related, and so we organized them into this network here, and what this represents, the nodes, re nodes represent the individual genes, where the um, edges represent the Pearson correlation of ex um, the um, expression during, um, between pairs of genes, and the y-axis just represents time. So what you can see here is that you have a whole network of genes that are failing to become activated during our EB differentiation. And as you can see here by these gene ontology categories, again, many of these have roles in processes that are important for cardiogenesis. And what I want to point out is that um, in many cases, the gene that really stands out to be um, misregulated early on is this MESP1. And if you remember at the beginning, 
I told you that MESP1 was actually um, marks the earliest known cardiac cell fate. And it gives rise to all of the other cell types in the cardiovascular system. So we're pretty excited by this. Um, one of the things that I also want to point out is that MESP1 seems to be under the direct control of at least brachyuri and perhaps eomesodermin, which are actually important markers for mesodermal induction in the primitive streak. So what we wanted to know is where does Braveheart get into the game, right? So we know that we see defects here, but um, we wanted to know whether or not it was um, upstream of this pathway as well. So what I'm showing you here is just some qPCR for a variety of markers during our time course. And as you can see here, although it's a little difficult to see, um, you'll have to take my word for it, brachyuri is not affected in the Braveheart depleted um, EBs, uh, whereas MESP1 and other downstream markers are. Eomesodermin is also not affected. So it really suggests to us that this defect lies between brachyuri and um, MESP1. And I think it's kind of interesting to note that um, although it's been shown quite um, convincingly that brachyuri does have a role in activating MESP1, in this case, brachyuri is still expressed, but MESP1 is not. So the expectation then would be if this long nine coding RNA was having a potent role and perhaps in restricting the fate of these cells towards this lineage, then it should be enriched in this particular population. So does it have a cell autonomous or non-autonomous fact? So what I'm showing you here is that if we look at Braveheart expression and the MSP1 plus population versus a MSP1 minus population, we do see enrichment consistent with the cell autonomous effect in perhaps controlling the restriction of mesoderm to the cardiac fate. Um, and I'm just going to go quickly through this. So our, our um, work also predicts that the genes that are um, affected by depletion of Braveheart should also be shared by targets of um, MESP1. And just to make a long story short, we compared our data with a data set from um, the Bondu lab where they actually induce MESP1. And so we would expect that the genes that go up in their study should go down in ours. Um, that's exactly what we saw. We saw a significant overlap in those genes. And again, if you look at those genes, they all have to do with transcriptional regulation and heart development. And so again, this really points to um, a really key role for this long non-coding RNA in early specification. But then the question is, if there's a direct relationship, we would expect that MESP1 induction could rescue the link RNA depleted phenotype. And so what we did is we took um, uh, ES cells that have a MESP1 inducible uh, transgene, and we induced it at day two, and we count contracting EBs. And so essentially what we saw is that uh, when you do induce MESP1, you actually rescue um, the knockdown phenotype, suggesting that these work in a common pathway and that Braveheart functions upstream. So there are a lot of caveats to um, our initial EB differentiation in the sense that it's a very generic differentiation. You're not giving these cells any goodies um, for directed differentiation. So we actually wanted to analyze the function in a more specific terms. So here we have an in vitro differentiation assay where we look at cardiomyocyte differentiation over several stages that involve ESL differentiation, um, mesoderm induction, cardiac progenitors, as well as cardiomyocytes. Um, and this is actually not a pull off the shelf kind of assay, and it's something that we developed with um, uh, our colleagues in UCSF, Benoit Bruneau's lab, and this is really based on some pioneer work from Gordon Keller's lab. So essentially, it's the timed uh, addition of and specific concentration of growth factors that allows you to actually isolate cells along this trajectory. And I just want to show you here, if I can do this, that at the end of this differentiation, you can get really a nice plate of um, beating cardiomyocytes. So we can actually get uh, uh, homogeneous cells toward the end of, of this process. And so this was important because it allowed us to assess exactly where things were going wrong, even if we were supplying the inductive signals. Um, and time's getting short, so I just want to show you that uh, we have good knockdown of our link, 
And then when we actually analyzed what was happening, if you look at day four, the mesoderm, you see that in the control, you have expression of brachyuri, maybe more in the, the knockdown for some reason, and eomesodermin, you have um, both expressed. However, you do not have markers um, that signify later differentiation events, such as GATA4 as well as RMSP1. What was most telling to us is that if you looked at the day 5.3 cells, where um, you're now have already extinguished brachyuri and eomesodermin in the control, these remain high um, in the Braveheart depleted cells. And this is also consistent with the, the lack of activation of these genes that you do observe in the control. So what I didn't tell you yet, though, is that, um, again, this is consistent with a block from going from mesoderm to the cardiac lineage, is that we also see this long non-coding RNA not only enriched in this population, but we see it in this, enriched in this population as well, suggesting that it's not only important for initiation, but progression and perhaps maintenance. And so we actually looked at this in neonatal cardiomyocytes because we did also observe that it was expressed in the heart. And so we could isolate neonatal cardiomyocytes and infect them with our hairpins and analyze gene expression. And what I want to show you here is we get good knockdown. And what we see is we actually surprisingly see that um, many of the genes that mark functional cardiomyocytes or, or sarcomeres actually are decreased in our knockdown in a fully functional cardiomyocyte. So even in that instance, you do see an effect. And here you can see that um, in the control case, you get nice myofibrils after day five in culture where they're completely disorganized in both hairpins, suggesting that you may need this long non-coding RNA also for maintenance of cell fate. Um, and then this also is um, reflected in cardiomyocyte surface area, whereas these actually show more compact structure. And what I don't have time to show you is that we've also done EM, and these also show um, sarcomeres that are disorganized and also look more hypertrophic. So this is all consistent. This was actually really surprising. Um, so I'm not going to be able to really get into this. I just want to maybe leave you with this thought is that how do you connect the initiation to the progression, to the maintenance. Because MESP1 is not expressed in these later cell types. Well, what I haven't told you yet is MESP1 is also a regulator of EMT by regulation of SNAIL, um, in addition to it having a role in regulation of lineage-specific transcription factors. So one of the things that we've actually observed is that no matter which stage you look at, um, and this is actually during cardiomyocyte differentiation, you see um, a lack of activation of snail, higher levels of E cadherin, and higher, um, lower levels of vimentin. So this suggests that these cells are not going through proper EMT. So this actually may link the process um, and be an important component of understanding uh, how this link RNA is actually regulating um, the entire process of, of cardiogenesis. Um, so I showed you one example. This is not all. We have many more long non-coding RNAs that actually are specifically expressed at various stages. And the cool thing is they actually are next to genes that have roles in uh, morphogenesis development and transcription. So we're currently analyzing, um, by using a, a large-scale screen, the function of many of these long non-coding RNAs at various stages of um, cardiomyocyte differentiation, hoping to find new players in heart development. So with that, I'm um, just going to summarize by saying two key take-home points. Um, we've shown you that Braveheart is necessary for initiation, progression, and maintenance of the cardiac lineage by regulating key cardiogenic transcription factors, um, as well as perhaps EMT transitions. And that Braveheart, as well as potentially many long encoding RNAs, are potent regulators of lineage commitment and certainly occupy important positions in the gene regulatory hierarchy. Our goals moving forward are to elucidate the mechanisms of how they function. I haven't really told you about that, but I'd love to talk to people um, after on some of our thoughts. And um, could these really be um, important potential therapeutic targets? Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank the people who um, have worked with me on this and other projects in the lab. So Carla and Johanna in the lab really drove 
this project forward. Um, I'd like to thank Burge Lab for some computational help, the JAX Lab for supplying us with reagents, um, and certainly the Biomicro Center and the rest of our collaborators.